Well, 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 would you look what the cat dragged in? It's me. I'm what the cat dragged in. That means it's time for another volume of Japan-only PS1 games, the series where we unearth some of the PS1 deep cuts exclusive to the land of giant Gundams and tasty, tasty food. Since it is the 11th volume of our little series, we're back to the regular format, which means we're going to play three games chosen at random via wheel, and one final game chosen by our lovely viewers, which is also selected at random via wheel. I'm just mad for the L wheel, what can I say? A regular old wheeler dealer, if you will. Anyway, since we're playing some Japanese exclusives, you know we are in for some weird ass video games. So, I hope you're sitting comfortably cause it's wheel time and you better believe it will provide. Wheel will provide. Kicking off volume 11, we have Kyoro chan no Purikura Dai Sakusen, which made its way to the PlayStation in February of the year 1999. So, I'ma let you all in on a little secret. I adore TV commercials. Apparently, when I was a baby, my favorite thing to watch on TV was the commercials. So much so that my parents recorded a VHS of just commercials, and it was all that I ever wanted to watch. Now, as weird as that sounds, this love of commercials continues on until this very day. Now, I'm not talking about modern advertisements, which are, let's be fair, fucking terrible. Seriously, I've watched a little bit of daytime TV since I moved to the UK and every ad is either somebody talking about how expensive funerals are or how bad a time donkeys are having. And I really wish I was joking about that last one. As it turns out, donkeys are really having an awful time. The commercials I enjoy tend to vary from really weird classic stuff from the 80s, 90s and early 2000s, old Irish ads that I'm specifically nostalgic for, and most notably Japanese adverts, which are probably the only modern advertisements that are still entertaining and also oftentimes absolutely insane. Now, on one of my late night commercial hunts during my teens, I came across a particular Japanese commercial with a catchy jingle that has pretty much been stuck in my head ever since. Yes, Choco Ball, a Japanese chocolate snack featuring this fun bird mascot. Now, I've never tried Choco Ball before in my life, but I have burned through these Choco Ball commercials many times over the years. You know, just in case I need a quick hit of serotonin. So imagine my surprise when I boot up today's game, this main menu appears, and I just sit there and scream, Oh my god, it's Choco Baru. And well, here we are. Yes, this right here is a game based on Kyoro-chan, the fun bird mascot of Chocoball, a snack from the Morinaga Confectionery Company. Now look, it's not too uncommon to see particular influential snack mascots get video games from time to time. I mean, we have multiple Cool Spot and Chester Cheetah games after all, and there was also Chex Quest, I guess, although 
that game came free with cereal and is also kind of rad, let's be fair. Well, I think it's safe to say Kyoro-chan is a particularly popular and well-known mascot over in Japan. Of course, we have years and years of fun commercials to dig through, but Kyoro-chan also starred in his own anime series, had plush toys that actually outsold the candy he was marketing in the first place, and of course, we have some Kyoro-chan video games, the first two of which made their way to the Game Boy, and the third and most recent Kyoro-chan video game made its way to the PlayStation, which is what we'll be looking at today. By the way, fans of the WarioWare series may notice some similarities between Kyoro-chan and the character Pioro, and it will probably come as no surprise that Pioro is a parody of Kyoro-chan, so there you go, the more you know. So what kind of game is Kyoro-chan on the PS1? Well, if you're like me, you'll be delighted to find out we have a colourful little 2D platformer on our hands, a genre which I frankly can't get enough of, especially when it involves chocolate birds. The game was both published and developed by legendary Japanese toy company Tomi, who I mostly know for all those Zoids and Naruto titles they kept pumping out during the 2000s. The game at its core is a very traditional experience. It's a linear platformer where the levels are spread out across five unique worlds, with each world featuring a total of three levels apiece. There are a few fun platformer gimmicks as you would come to expect from the genre, but this is another game where the majority of the experience will be running and jumping and spitting seeds on enemies. You know, bird stuff. Now the game seems to have a simple story, punctuated by some cute voice cutscenes which in spite of my best efforts, I could never really pick up on what was going on during, but really when it comes to platformers, specifically ones based on confectionery mascots, I can kind of live without knowing the nitty gritty, you know? Although one thing that is kind of important and actually plays into the gameplay somewhat, is the appearance of these photo boots known as Purikura in Japan. Many of you might already be aware of Purikura. There are those boots where you can take a picture and then add tons of fun images and effects to dial up the cute factor to extreme levels. There. Pretty great. Well, this game isn't just about making it to the end of the various levels, it's also about traversing said levels in search of Purikura boots, so you can take a variety of fun photos featuring our little buddy Kyoro-chan here. Photos that you can edit and customise to your liking, keeping in the spirit of Purikura, after all. It certainly makes for one of the more unique platformers I've played, and you know what? I ain't complaining. Each level has a number of these Puri Kura boots to seek out, and each world has a checklist of images to tick off. So even though the only mandatory goal in a level is really just to make it to the end, for those who love collecting stuff, or uh, making funny bird pictures, this extra element makes for some nice replayability, since a lot of these photo boots are scattered across the levels and require a bit more freeform exploration to seek out, since the levels often have multiple higher and lower paths that you can take. There's even additional photos that you can only obtain from item boxes and levels, but these are pre-edited unfortunately, but still needed for completing your checklist. Now, what do you get for completing this checklist? Uh, as far as I know, nothing. These pictures aren't actually required for progression, nor do they unlock anything, so they're really just a fun little novelty for people who like collecting stuff. If you wanted to play this game as a straight up platformer and ignore all that stuff, well, you could do that, but come on, look at this stuff. This is great. Alrighty, so let's focus on the platforming gameplay itself, since it is a little bit unusual, at least on the movement front. Kyoro-chan kind of controls like a weird hybrid of Sonic the Hedgehog and Mario, and what I mean by that is that Kyoro has like sonic momentum and speed, but the moveset of Mario, you know, things like butt stomps, the Yoshi flutter for some light hovering action, it honestly works quite well for the most part, but it may take some time to get used to since Kyoro feels pretty damn heavy considering he's just a little chocolate bird after all. Outside of that, you can also collect three different power-ups from the boxes around the levels. These include the aforementioned seeds, which you can spit to take out enemies, a party blower, which lets you also take out enemies, and this orange flower, which gives your flutter jump a little bit of extra height, which is mandatory for some of the harder to reach areas. So far, it's all pretty standard stuff, but one of the more interesting aspects of Kyoro-chan's gameplay revolves around the health system. So you see this number in the top left corner. This represents both your health and the number of Choco Balls that you currently hold. Choco Balls are the basic collectible of this game. They come in various colours, you can find them in boxes, and sometimes enemies are even disguised as them, which is kind of a scumbag move, honestly. Now, when you begin the game, you can only hold up to 100 Choco Balls, but if you collect some of the Morinaga collectibles, you can increase this number to extend your health permanently. And if you run out of Choco Balls, you die. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, there's actually more to it than that. 
These balls also affect your ability to jump. The more you have, the higher you can jump. In fact, if you have at least 70 in your possession, you can even super jump by crouching for a few seconds, which is incredibly useful. On the flip side, if you ever drop down below 30 chocoballs, you can barely make it onto some of the ledges in this game, increasing the difficulty dramatically. In other words, this is a game that gets harder the worse you're doing, so keeping stocked up on chocoballs and avoiding damage whenever possible is a must. Now that being said, I personally found this game to be incredibly easy. There's an abundance of chocoballs in every level, so even when you do mess up, you can usually get back to tip-top shape in a matter of seconds, so much so that I didn't drop below zero a single time during my playthrough. Only one level really gave me any trouble at all, and that was because I kept messing up a particularly tough jump and stupidly used up all the spare chocoballs in the level, even though I didn't need them. In fact, that's the only way I ever found out what these gold coins do, which save you from death and give you an additional 50 chocoballs, almost like an insta-life. I ended up just restarting the level because I actually botched it that badly, but yeah, otherwise, from start to finish, it's just a nice leisurely platformer, not easy to the point of it being boring, but one that will rarely frustrate or punish you. Now, outside of the standard running and jumping, you will come across the odd gimmick in certain levels. The snow levels feature some fun snowmobile segments. There's a cool underwater part with a gun that controlled really well, I thought, and even a level in a pirate ship where you gotta butt slam barrels to navigate through a maze. It's kinda weird, but hey, it's enjoyable. You can also come across one of three different bonus levels by breaking open these rainbow boxes. The three mini games on offer range from some rather dull matching and rock paper scissor games to a pretty enjoyable mini game where you have to move a basket around to catch some balls being shot out. Not the best selection of mini games you'll ever see, but hey, they're fun enough. So yeah, all things considered, this game is really punching above its weight in a lot of aspects. This very much could be a simple throwaway platformer, but honestly, it's got a lot going for it. Although I suppose if I had one major issue with it is that the game kind of feels, I'm not gonna say incomplete, but it just feels a bit oddly paced. For one, the game doesn't feature any boss battles. Now, I'm not in the camp that thinks every platformer needs boss battles, but moving from one world to the next feels like it lacks any sort of punctuation. Like, in many ways, you could almost do without the whole world thing and just have the game be 15 consecutive levels. It really wouldn't make much of a difference. Also, the final string of levels doesn't really feel like endgame content either. They follow a jungle theme, but in any other platformer, these would be simple early or mid-game levels, not the grand finale, you know? You just beat them and there you go, that's the end of the game. No fanfare, no nothing really. Kind of an anti-climax. Now I say this as if I was expecting something from the story, which I really wasn't, but everybody likes a cool final level or boss fight, you know? Something truly worthy of reaching the end of your journey, and this game certainly does not have that, even if the journey itself was admittedly a pretty fun time. Of course, that being said, I also didn't collect all the photos across each level, so you never know, maybe some cool secret final or ending appears if you do that. So. I'll leave that as a surprise for somebody more talented and dedicated than I am to find out. Now before we wrap up, we gotta take some time to talk about the presentation, which in many ways is the highlight of the game. Now, clearly the visuals here are pretty great. It's not exactly the most technically impressive 2D game you will see on the console, but I think it makes up for a lot of that with the extreme amounts of personality on display. Bright colorful levels with varied environments, some great fun enemy designs, most of which are based on various types of foods, all of which have great attack animations by the way. But most of all, Kyoro chan himself is just so expressive throughout this entire game. It doesn't matter what this bird is doing, he is gonna look really cute doing it. I always say you can judge a good platformer character by the quality of their idle animations, and if we're going by these ones, Kyoro-chan is a damn good platformer character, let me tell you. And Kyoro vibing along to the music isn't just for show either, because the most surprising aspect of this game has to be the soundtrack, which kind of stole the show for me. Not only is it really good, but it's also very unusual and absolutely not what you would expect from a game that looks like this. Here, Check out some highlights and see for yourself.
Immediately after playing this thing, I went to see if somebody had uploaded the OST anywhere, and unfortunately, the entire thing doesn't seem to be on the net. So, in the spirit of vibing with our little bird friend, and mostly because the game has a convenient sound test, I've uploaded the OST onto YouTube under my new music-only burner account, DJ Gex 3D. So, if you want to check out the full thing, I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Anyway, that was Kyoro-chan Purikura Daisakusen, a lovely little 2D platformer that turned out to be a very pleasant surprise. Don't get me wrong, this isn't an all-time classic platformer by any stretch of the imagination. It's got some odd pacing and even even other controls at times, but for what it is, it's a fun, colourful adventure through some gorgeous food filth lands with one of the most memorable soundtracks I've heard in quite some time. Also, you can stop to take funny photos every now and then, and come on, how could you not love that? Aw, oh, look at them. Unfortunately, the game itself is kind of hard to come across in the wild, and when you do come across it, it'll likely be going for a bit more than it's probably worth. But if you ever do come across a copy, have three hours to kill, and really like cute 2D chocolate bird platformers, then this title should be right up your alley. <laughs> will provide Next up, we have Dangan, making its way to the PlayStation approximately a year after a previous game in February of the year 2000. And I don't know about you, but I really dug that opening movie. It's about as PS1 as they come, with some cool transitions to boot. It sure did leave me sufficiently hyped for what was to come. And what we got is a very, very odd game. Now on paper, Dangan seems like something I would really enjoy. We have a sort of top-down shooter beat-em-up hybrid. Well. I guess it's not strictly a top-down game. There is some isometric stuff in here too, but for the most part, it's a pretty arcadey top-down shooter beat-em-up hybrid. Now, what could be odd about a game like this? Well, we're about to find out, aren't we? First things first, the game comes from a developer called Media Muse. I don't blame you if you've never heard of them because none of their games ever left Japan. Although oddly, I do actually own one of their Saturn releases, a game called Gokin Mayu Anarchy in the Nippon, a pretty subpar Virtua Fighter clone if I'm being honest. But it does have a PlayStation exclusive follow-up that we may see someday if we're lucky. But besides all that fighting game jank, Media Muse are mostly known for their work on survival sims, having released a number across different platforms, including the Super Nintendo, PC FM Towns, and even our old friend, the PlayStation. Dangan, on the other hand, is unlike any of Media Muse's previous games. In this game, we take the role of two special operatives named Jack and Kate, who have been tasked with taking down a secret society by the name of Eden, who have kidnapped a girl named Claire. 
Honestly, that's about all I was able to glean from the story, but there are some brief cutscenes from time to time where you argue with the various Eden goons before fighting them, which I very much appreciate, even if some of them are legitimately little girls who you end up punching a lot. Yeah, this game's kind of weird. So onto the gameplay, where the goal is essentially to navigate through rooms filled with goons and various turrets, and when you reach the end of the room, you move to a different room, and you just do this on repeat until you reach a boss at the end. That room will also likely have some goons and turrets, but uh, pay them no mind, cause it's boss time. There's a grand total of 8 levels, well, 10 technically since 2 of the levels are split into A and B for some reason. Not quite sure why that happens. But between levels, you'll alternate between our two playable characters, Jack and Kate, who control pretty much identically for the most part, outside of some different attack animations. And speaking of attacks, you got a few different options available to you. The first is melee in the form of a simple tree hit combo. It does good damage, it knocks enemies back, and you can even use it to blow up tanks. So clearly it's quite effective. You've also got one of those special attacks that drain your health bar upon use, but the damage ratio on it is actually quite poor, so there's pretty much no reason to ever use it. The next option is shooting your enemies, which you can do by using one of five weapons. At the beginning, you'll only have access to your pistol, which has unlimited ammo, but does low damage, and uh, you can't move while using it, which means you're almost guaranteed to take damage if you do use it. The next weapons all need to be found in the environment by breaking boxes and, uh, trucks, I guess. We've got a machine gun, laser gun, flamethrower, and finally a rocket launcher, all of which you can thankfully move with while using. Although ammo for these guns are limited, but can be obtained by smashing open things, and sometimes even by killing enemies. The only other pickup in this game is health packs, which as you'd imagine are quite useful and come in small, medium and large varieties. Now the last ability our characters have is probably the most important, a simple dodge performed by pressing the circle button. If timed right, this allows you to avoid incoming fire, but if you input a melee attack right after a dodge, it also unleashes a powerful counter attack. This attack is very, very useful, but we'll get to that in a moment. And yeah, that's pretty much all there is to Dangan. Truthfully, it's a very, very simple game. There's no additional mechanics, modes, options, no two player, not even any camera controls. Just run around, beat stuff up and occasionally shoot things. Now, there's nothing wrong with that per se. In fact, if anything, this should make for a pretty fun game, right? Well, Dangan is unfortunately not a very fun game. In fact, it's actually pretty bad. Dangan has a number of issues, almost all of which come down to its core gameplay, which is almost designed for you to avoid on purpose. Now what I mean by that is in Dangan, a game where you are meant to fight enemies with your various abilities, doing so almost always ends up with you being punished for it. Shooting enemies, fighting enemies, there's pretty much no reason to ever do this because you get nothing for it except taking damage. There's no scoring system, no kill counters, no objectives, the only goal is just to make it to the exit of an area. Now you may say the reward is the combat itself, which yeah, if the game is fun, you'd want to partake in, but it's really not. Shooting is slow and awkward in this game. You can only aim in one of eight directions, and as we mentioned, using the pistol, you gotta stand still. Using other weapons, you can move, but very slowly, and even then, the damage isn't great, and firing consecutively often requires a cooldown or wind up depending on the weapon, which also makes it not very fun. In fact, hand-to-hand -hand combat as a whole is just significantly more powerful and useful in every scenario, from grunts to turrets and even bosses, which we'll get to in a moment. Combat, for lack of a better term, is just kind of a drag, really. Not to mention the standard enemies infinitely respawn from random locations, so if you kill one, another will take its place in a few seconds. So, with no reward for combat and enemies constantly respawning, the smart and correct choice is to simply run through every single level and just avoid combat outright whenever possible. This turns the game into a sort of obstacle course really, but you know what? Playing the game anyway other than this will result in frustration and damage to your health bar. So uh, yeah, there you go. If you do eventually die, which you probably will thanks to some awkwardly placed turrets, there's no real penalty other than just respawning in the room you just came into, which will set you back no more than about a minute or two at most. It seems like such a brain dead way to play a game, but trying to play it any way other than this will just make you regret it and you'll soon come back to running through the levels all over again. So that kind of sucks, but what about the bosses? Uh, 
also not great. Bosses usually just bombard you with projectiles and other random stuff, which bumps the difficulty up significantly, especially considering your limited movement with weapons. But soon into the game, I found that you can actually stun lock bosses using the counter blow attack, which works very effectively on, on every single boss if timed right. So the boss fights go from being kind of cheap and lopsided in their favour to a cakewalk if you know how to time inputs correctly. So yeah, that's that. As for the presentation, this is honestly a pretty bland looking game, considering it's 2000 release date. I do enjoy the cutscenes as brief as they are, but in-game models are small and lacking in detail, environments are dull and feature a ton of pop-in. Now, there are some standout textures with some nice lighting here and there, but for the most part, the game just isn't very appealing to the eyes. It's nothing offensive, but generic and completely forgettable all the same. The sound, likewise, isn't anything to write home about. Sound effects are fine, and there is one or two standout music tracks that I consider quite good, but the majority of the music is once again very forgettable, which frankly is on brand for Dangan as a whole. So yeah, that's Dangan. It takes a little over an hour to be and is overall just a very dull experience. I'm not quite sure what they were hoping to achieve with this game, especially in the year 2000. I mean, the concept itself is a winner in my book, but so much of it is just poorly taught out and unrefined. It's rare that a game makes me want to just avoid all of its content and mechanics, but Dangan is special in that it punishes you for playing it properly. It really is quite something. I don't know if this was a budget title or just a little side project for Media Muse or whatever, but safe to say, Dangan didn't turn out very well, which is a shame considering the concept of a run and gun beat em up hybrid is always going to be a winner in my book. Just look at Capcom's Cannon Spike on the Dreamcast or the excellent PS2 title The Red Star for an example of how to do this idea justice. Dangan, on the other hand, is an example of a weird experiment that just misses the mark across the board. A PS1 obscurity that probably deserves to remain as such, even if the intro movie kinda rules. will provide.
Kicking off the second half of Volume 11, we have Kaze no Notam, Notam of Wind, which made its way to the PlayStation in September of the year 1997. As we've seen many times throughout this series of videos, the PlayStation certainly has some unique games in its library, and I think it's safe to say Kaze no Notam is certainly one of them. What we have here is a hot air balloon simulator, but not just a hot air balloon simulator, Kaze no Notam is also a low poly treat for your eyes and your ears, in fact, you might even say this game is packing some serious aesthetic. It's really quite something. Seriously, look at this box. Did you luxuriate in the wind? I mean, come on. Now this game comes from a developer called Artdink, who are generally known for putting out some of the more experimental titles on the console, whether it's the Sea Life exploration game Aquanauts Holiday, the mech programming battler Carnage Heart, or the game all about building a tower out of animal bones to reach the sun, aptly named Tale of the Sun. If that all sounds a little too weird for you though, they're probably best known for their long-running train simulation series A-Train, and more recently, they made some Sword Art Online games. You either die a hero or live long enough to make sword art games, I guess. Well, another of Art Dink's lovely experimental PS1 games is Kaze no Notam, a game all about vibing in your hot air balloon to some lovely music, while you enjoy the low poly cityscapes and environments around you. Well, that's a lie, there is more to it than that, but if you wanted to ignore all that, you could just vibe in your balloon all day. No? Alright then, let's talk about the game and modes, why don't we? So, Kaze no Notam itself is relatively light on content, which isn't all that unusual for an earlier release on the console. Modes-wise, we have the choice of two, a task mode and a mission mode. In task mode, you have a total of three areas to pick from, and once you pick your location, you then choose from one of the game's three gameplay modes, Fly In, Try Delta, or Wolf Hunt. And once you're happy with your choice, you then pick your time of day, the weather, and which of the nine music tracks you'd like to accompany you on your journey. Once you're into the game, you then pick a location to spawn on the map, and from there, well, it's hardcore hot air balloon action, let me tell you. Now, flying around actually requires very little input from the player, just like in real life, your balloon's speed and flight path is pretty much dictated by the will of the wind. All you have control over is where do you want to go up by using a little bit of fire to heat the air inside the balloon causing it to rise, or you can go down by cooling the air inside the balloon causing it to fall. Triangle to go up, X to go down. Nice and simple. And while one of the big appeals of this game is kind of just chilling and going where the wind takes you, those three tasks we talked about before, fly in, try delta and wolf hunt, well they're going to need you to fly to specific locations across the map, and the way that you do that is by using the wind to guide you there, of course. You see these five green icons on the right of the screen. Each of these represents the direction the wind is blowing at a certain height. So to navigate across the map, you're gonna have to raise and lower the balloon to match the direction you wanna go. Of course, this is sometimes easier said than done because not only will you have to deal with obstacles in your path like buildings and mountains, but the winds also randomly change at the drop of a hat. So you'll need to be keeping an eye on things and adjusting your balloon's height accordingly if you wanna make it to your destination before your fuel gauge at the bottom runs out and you inevitably come to a halt on the ground. Now, navigation in this game is made pretty easy thanks to a few things. You've got a compass at the top of the screen to help you track which direction you're going, and you can also rotate the camera around your balloon by using the D-pad, which handily also makes the green wind icons adjust alongside it. Most useful of all though, you can bring up a map at any time just by pressing the square button, which allows you to see your current direction and also your objective. So when in doubt, take a quick look at this and you'll always be able to get back on track. So yeah, in spite of the sparse UI, the movement and navigation is pretty easy to wrap your head around even if you're a ballooning novice, which is a good thing because you're going to need those skills to take on the game's three tasks. The first of which, fly in, is probably the most straightforward. This mode tasks you with simply flying towards a specific location on the map and when you make it to that location, you'll see a target on the ground. Now you may think you need to fly down and land on that target like some sort of pilot wings game, but nope, every task in this game actually requires the use of a shooting system. If you press R1 on the controller, you can enter into a first person view, and if you press circle here, you can fire out one of three markers. The goal in this mode is to try get your marker as close to the center of the target as possible, and the closest one is then counted as your score. Nice and simple, really. The next game mode, Tri-Delta, 
Not as nice and simple. Quite difficult, actually. This mode requires you to use your tree markers to basically make a triangle around the map, with the goal being to cover as big an area as you can with said triangle. The reason this is so tough is because managing your fuel and the winds can be pretty tricky in a lot of cases. So if things go wrong for you, which they often will, you can end up with a pretty crappy triangle when all is said and done. But hey, at the very least it promotes exploring the map, so you're bound to see some nice sights along the way. And the final task, Wolf Hunt, is the easiest by a long shot. The goal here is to simply shoot down a wolf balloon from a bunch of floating animal balloons that appear near your spawn point. Now this in theory is probably the most appealing mode, at least to me, but the balloons spawn very close to your start point, so in the many attempts I made at this mode, they were all usually over and done within seconds, which really just left me clamoring for more hot air balloon action, you know? Each of these modes have high scores and records to break, which should keep you busy for a while, especially since the number one rank for each of these requires almost flawless execution, but the main single player content is actually located in the round mode, which gives you a total of 9 different missions to both help train you on the basics of gameplay, as well as give you some expert level challenges along the way. Now the gameplay here isn't anything new that we haven't already covered in the try mode, it's just individual challenges featuring the existing tree modes, but they do offer some stricter and more specific objectives, so if you want to go pro at the uh, nice hot air balloon game, this is the place to do it. So yeah, that's a little overlook at the gameplay and modes on offer. I suppose the only other notable feature is the cute hot air balloon design suite that lets you customize up to five balloons to your liking, which is something I didn't really know I needed in my life until I tried it, so there you go. Now the thing about No Time of Wind is that on paper, this seems like it should be the most relaxing game ever, right? And in many ways it really is, but personally I feel in some ways the gameplay and mechanics also kind of get in the way of that a little bit. And what I mean by that is that the wind in this game, it's kind of a jerk. The wind changes a lot, and I mean a lot. And not only does it change a lot, but oftentimes even though you've got five directions you could be going, you could go through an entire level without the wind ever blowing you in the direction you need to go. So much so that multiple times I got stuck in mountain ranges or even outright blown out of bounds with no viable options to get me back on track, let alone where I wanted to go. This means completing objectives can sometimes be a bit RNG or luck based and when you factor this in with a fuel meter that adds an extra layer of tension, well, relaxing is sometimes the opposite of what this game is. Sometimes you can even pick a spawn point and get stuck immediately as you start. It is the worst. Personally for me, I felt I enjoyed this game a lot more when I actually stopped treating it like a game. Instead of worrying about the objectives, I would just go into a map and travel around at my own pace, just see where the wind takes me. Really the appeal of this game and what I think makes it so special isn't the gameplay, but the vibe and presentation of it. I suppose it is kind of funny that in 97, Art Dink kind of accidentally made the perfect game to appeal to modern vaporwave aficionados, but even since, I don't think any game has ever captured the feel and aesthetic of this movement so well. First, let's talk about the menus and UI, and I mean, this thing is so good. I love when games are a treat to simply just navigate around before you even get into the gameplay, and I mean, this is such a lovely showcase for the era. The sky blue background, the name entry screen, the stage select, and my god, this record screen. This is legitimately one of the coolest things I have ever seen in a game. Look at it go! I cannot get enough of it. As for the in-game visuals, well, as I said before, this is a low poly visual feast, and I really mean it. Sure, you could nitpick and critique the draw distance and pop in, as well as some of the textures here and there, but this is one of those instances where I think the quality of the graphics actually complement its overall aesthetic. It's this lovely example of early 3D with bright colors and simple effects. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at an open plane during the day or a city at night, there's just something so charming and beautiful to it all. The time of day and weather effects really add to this as well. The three stages you can choose from, a small medieval town, a modern city and a dry arid canyon all look great whether it's on a rainy sunset or a snowy night, and each of these levels have some eye-catching locations to seek out as well. Maybe you'll be lucky to see an aurora in the sky, or even stumble across an advanced civilization hidden in a canyon. The game is constantly a joy to experience on the visual front, and is a fine case of beauty and creativity in spite of limitation. I'll tell you what isn't suffering from limitations though, the game's music. And I know you can kind of tell by looking at this thing, the music 
it's got to be something special, right? And I kind of figured it would be, but I wasn't ready for how good this thing was going to be. This game right here features maybe one of the best soundtracks on the PlayStation. It's basically a long lost vaporwave album that has a hot air balloon game attached to it. While the music isn't strictly vaporwave, it's actually a really varied, atmospheric and relaxing collection of 90s video game music that sounds like nothing else on the console. Not only is it perfect to fly a balloon to, but it's just great background music in general. I mean, I've been listening to the whole thing on repeat while writing this script and I really can't get over how good some of these tunes are. Have a listen to a small sample and hear for yourself. Well, that was a look at Kaze no Notam, a very interesting and unique experience on the console. It's a rare case where I think the gameplay actually betrays a lot of the joy that's to be found in this game. Now, I know that's a really odd thing to say, but I really think Kaze no Notam is at its best when you're just vibing and enjoying the sights and sounds at your own pace. Actually trying to complete the game's objectives often ends up frustrating you more than anything, which considering this game's potential for being one of the all-time great relaxation games, is really quite the shame. But on the bright side, the game never forces you into playing the game as intended. You can simply pick an area, change the weather, and put on your favorite tune and just fly into the sunset if you like. And when all of this comes together and hits just right, really there's few games on the PlayStation or any platform for that matter that can make you feel as at peace as this one does. Even if it does mean that you'll unavoidably crash into a mountain from time to time, but hey, we've all been there. provide
Rounding out volume 11, we have our viewer selection, Screaming Mad George's Paranoia Escape, which made its way to the PlayStation in May of the year 1998. This game was chosen for the wheel by Wiki Studios, and look, I know I highlighted some weird games on this channel, but Wiki Studios might have just picked the weirdest. So first up, a little backstory on our game's namesake, Joji Tani, aka Screaming Mad George, legendary Japanese special effects artist, film director and musician, and in this case, also games designer. Now even if you're unfamiliar with Screaming Mad George the character, there's a good chance you've probably seen some of his work. Known for his surreal and gory special effects, he worked on a ton of movies over the years including Predator, The Abyss, and my personal favourite, John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. You see this stuff? This is George's work. Although on a personal level, the most interesting thing I found out about him while researching this video is that Screaming Mad George was the dude who created and designed all the Slipknot masks during the Iowa and Subliminal Versus era, which is probably the most iconic and recognisable era of Slipknot masks. Now we've only really just scratched the surface of Screaming Mad George's incredible career, but today we're not going to delve too much into that, but instead take a look at the time Screaming Mad George decided he would try his hand at making a video game, and the result is Paranoia Escape, which as you'd imagine, is absolutely bonkers. The concept, design, the music, all of it is provided by Screaming Mad George. As for the development duties, well that's thanks to some little known Japanese companies called Matilda and Jorodan. And would you believe, nowadays Jorodan actually runs and publishes a transport route navigation website. Well, wonder what they were doing before that. Uh, making body horror pinball, I suppose. So this is Paranoia Escape. It's pinball, but really, really fucked up pinball. You hit a ball, use your bones as flippers, and get points by taking out random orifices that spawn out of the various organs and uh, meat you traverse on. What's not to love? Now while pinball is the core of the gameplay here, in a twist you also have the ability to freely move around the play area. So. In many ways, it's kind of like a pinball FPS hybrid, where the goal isn't necessarily to sit in one place and score as many points as possible, but rather to navigate through the play area with your ball and complete objectives, like making it to the end of the arena, killing all the enemies within it, or even taking out some bosses from time to time. Really, really creepy bosses. Now look, you know I love a weird and unique concept, but this right here has to be one of the most batshit insane things I have ever witnessed in the game. But to be fair, if I was in the market for a Screaming Mad George video game, this is the kind of thing I'd expect, and in that regard, it absolutely doesn't disappoint. But let's set aside all this, uh, everything for a moment and analyse the game as a whole, or at least we'll do our best to anyway. So first things first, is there a story or plot to this game? Uh, no. As far as I can tell, we're a couple of skeleton flippers shooting brain balls just to fuck shit up, and you know what? That's good enough for me. The only text you'll see during the gameplay itself is before each level, where it will give you information on your target during the level and some hints on how to beat it. But honestly, most levels are relatively straightforward anyway, since the solution is more or less hit big thing with ball, or simply make it to the exit. The game itself has a nice linear flow. There's a total of three worlds with three main levels. I feel like I've said that before in this video at some point. And there's also a few sporadic boss battles thrown in for good effect. The levels have names like Symptom, Infected, and Forgotten, and take place anywhere from nightmarish hellscapes littered with random body parts and eyes in the sky, cancer infested intestines with various demons to fight, and a place I can only describe as stupid sexy leg world. Sometimes Screaming Mad George himself even makes an appearance, just in case you ever forget why the game is the way it is. Control wise, things are kept relatively simple. You control the two flippers by pressing the L1 and R1 buttons, and movement is controlled using either the D-pad or the forward face buttons. There are no camera controls here, and while you can move backwards throughout a level, you can't turn around, so you want to keep on top of your movement to maintain a good view and avoid your brain ball slipping past you into the gutter, or whatever it is that exists in the eternal void behind you. By default, you begin the game with 10 balls, and if you lose all 10, you'll have to go back to the beginning of the level with another 10. Now, if you like, you can adjust this in the options to give yourself more balls or even infinite balls, but the game is honestly quite easy and forgiving on the default difficulty, so 
you should be fine either way. There's also a health bar in the bottom left that reduces if your flippers ever take damage from enemies or the environment, but this reduces at such a slow pace that you'd probably have to go out of your way to actually perish from this. So even when it was low, I mostly just paid no attention to it. As for pickups, well, we've got a grand total of three. First, there's these blue orbs that give you points. The more you collect in a level, the more they are worth, and if it's big points you're after, then these blue balls are very important. Plus, points can give you extra balls as well, so you might as well go out of your way and try to get them whenever they spawn. Next, we have these red orbs, which are known as options. These essentially help cover the left and right of your flippers and act as an additional barricade to stop the balls getting by you. The more of these you collect, the more width you cover on the stage, so these are a must-have as the game goes on. Finally, you can also collect this lightning pickup that creates a temporary barrier in the middle of your flippers, which as you'd imagine, is very handy. You see, in this game, you can fire your balls not just by using your flippers, but you can also just run into the ball and propel it that way by using force. Once you have this barricade, not only does it make that even easier, but it also lessens the risk of you losing a ball as well, which is always nice. And yeah, that's about all there is to the gameplay in Paranoia Escape. It's first person pinball, what can you say? Conceptually, I quite like it to be honest, it's a fun arcadey twist on the pinball genre, not to mention all the incredible sights and sounds that come along with it. Now that being said though, if you were to judge this game solely on the quality of the gameplay here, well I think it's fair to say Paranoia Escape is more than a little, uh, rough around the edges. The player movement, hit detection, ball physics, environmental design, a lot of this doesn't work very well. Now don't get me wrong, it does work, but it all feels very, I don't know, messy, I guess you could say. Like if you were to judge this game on the quality of its pinball, it is far from good. It's strange, unique and endearing, but it's not very good. The first person movement is also very stiff and oftentimes way too slow for some of the tighter areas in this game. It's lucky the game is so forgiving with lives and checkpoints, cause if it wasn't, I could see this game frustrating players very, very quickly. The gameplay here is just lacking a bit of polish and finesse to really do its concept justice, I guess. But this is one of the rare cases where I can kind of forgive the game's flaws and issues because when you take a back seat and really analyze this thing as a whole, the gameplay, the design, the visuals, the music, the one word I would use to describe this game is punk. This is one of the purest examples of a punk video game, a scrappy, unpolished gem that goes against the grain to create something just so raw, abrasive, and at times disgusting in the name of just creating something cool and interesting. Is the gameplay here good? No, not really, but it's quite possibly the least boring game I have ever played. Every level, every boss, every piece of music just kept giving me more and more questions, and any time I thought I'd get an answer, things just kept getting weirder and more surreal. At one point towards the end, the game gives you this strange picture puzzle, and when you solve it, you become a weird mechanical baby and have to avoid zombies while opening coffins to find a king and a queen, and when you reunite them on a bed in the center of the area, they merge into a giant angel and the game just kinda ends. Look at this shit. Now this, this is art. And I mean, speaking of art, you've already seen how this game looks. Is it the most technically polished or appealing game on the PS1? Nope, just like the gameplay, the visuals here are raw as heck, but my god, I have played some weird shit in my time, but this right here is probably the most unfiltered madness I have ever seen in a game. And like, I don't think this is being weird for the sake of it either. This game has themes and concepts running through it that were consistent and well taught out. It's manic and a little hard to understand at times, but Screaming Mad George knew what he was doing here, even if uh, we don't. As for the music, well, it's suitably crazy as you would expect. George himself began his career in punk bands, so it's only natural that the music he created for this game is loud, abrasive, industrial, raw, weird as heck, but above all else, surprisingly catchy too. It's another soundtrack that you can listen to in full on YouTube, and if you like industrial punk, it's a big recommendation from me. Now, it certainly won't be for everybody, but hey, have a listen for yourself and see what you think.
So that was Screaming Mad George's Paranoia Escape, a very short game taking a little over a half hour to be, and one that I probably won't be playing again anytime soon, but my god, was it a trip. This is a fine example of a game that's kind of bad, but as an experience, it's so surreal and endearing that it's very easy to overlook its flaws and kind of just enjoy it for what it is. There's always a lot of debate about the legitimacy of video games as an art form, and some of the greatest art you'll see can oftentimes be challenging and uncomfortable, and I think the same can be said for games. Does a game have to be polished and functional to be considered good and worth your time? It's never been the case for music or film, so why should it be different for video games? It's unlikely you'd ever see a game like this get a proper release nowadays, because this sort of stuff is almost exclusively reserved for some of the smallest indie devs on the scene, who in many ways are the modern punks of the video game industry. But for the fifth gen, this right here, I think represents another reason why this era is so special, a time where unfiltered creativity could be bottled up, printed on a disc and stored away on your shelf. So when your friends come over, you can go, hey, check out this crazy shit. And let me tell you, ain't nobody gonna be doing that with a PS5 game anytime soon. I can guarantee it. Ciao, Jim. There you have it, those were our four picks for Volume 11 of Japan only PS1 games. And I feel like I say this every time, but those were certainly some video games, weren't they? We took a look at a lovely 2D mascot platformer about a chocolate bird who you can also put in some awful situations via image alteration. A game that has a great opening cutscene and some gameplay that might get child protection services called on you if anybody happened to walk in while you were playing it. A hot air balloon simulator that allows you to answer the age old question. Can you indeed luxuriate in the wind? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. And finally, the wackiest pinball game since Kiss Pinball. In fact, the whole game kind of makes Kiss seem like a family-friendly Christian knockoff act in comparison. Plus, there's also some sexy leg people, so you know, that's nice for all the sexy leg folk out there. Now, as always, it's time to crack out the arbitrary ranking system and rate today's selection of games. Are any of them must plays? Are they worth trying if you like the look of them? Were any of them just kind of meh, possibly even trash and not worth your time at all? Or did I find any of them unplayable due to the language barrier? Well, Volume 11 selection sees Dangan become the second game to make it into the Japan only trash tier, and the remaining three games, Kyoro Chan, Kaze no Notam, and Paranoia Escape, all slotting nicely into the tri tier. Dangan, as I said before, is an odd game. It seems like a winning formula that's kind of hard to mess up, right? A top down arcade style beat em up slash shooter, but through a combination of awkward limiting controls, boring uninspired gameplay, and frankly some downright poor game design, Dangan ends up being a game that just fails on almost every level. Sure, it's got some nice cutscenes, the odd bit of catchy music, and lets you punch a tank until it explodes, but even so, it's just a game that at best is pretty boring, and at worst is very, very frustrating. It proves that even with a fun, simple concept, you can indeed drop the ball quite dramatically, it seems. As for Kyoro-chan, this is a nice, safe, if unremarkable 2D platformer that should please fans of the genre. While the gameplay is personally nothing to write home about thanks to its easy difficulty and somewhat odd player movement, where Kyoro-chan will win you over, it's with its bright, cheery aesthetic, personality-filled characters, delightful picture-collecting side content, and its excellent and varied soundtrack. It's not going to challenge many other platformers on the console for the top spot, but as far as licensed games based on snack mascots go, this one definitely punches above its weight, and then some. Kaze no Notam, on the other hand, is very much one of the console's most intriguing games. It offers up a concept, aesthetic, and gameplay that's just so unlike anything else I've ever played on the platform. It's a shame then that unfortunately Art Dink's attempts at gamifying this thing 
actually let down and hinder its best aspects, I feel, mostly thanks to some unforgiving and RNG-based win systems that make the game's tasks unnecessarily frustrating to complete. That being said, if you just ignore that stuff and want to simply design a hot air balloon, explore some beautiful polygonal 3D landscapes and listen to one of the best soundtracks on the console, well then this is the game for you. Now it certainly won't be for everybody, but Kaze no Notam really is a one of a kind treat. And speaking of one of a kind, Screaming Mad George's Paranoia Escape. What the fuck is going on here? Now I'll be honest, gameplay wise, this thing isn't very good. It's rough, it controls poorly, and sometimes it drops into single digit frames. But my god, if there was ever a game I recommend playing for the experience, for the trip it will take you on, it's this one. From the insane visuals and locales to the excellent raw punk rock soundtrack, all from the mind of Screaming Mad George himself, this right here is proof that a game doesn't have to play well or even be very polished to be captivating and worthy of your time. This is once again a game that absolutely won't be for everybody, which is uh, putting it lightly I guess, but if you like dark disgusting imagery, industrial punk rock and uh, pinball, well then I promise you this is unlike anything you have or will ever play, so why not give it a shot? Come on, do it for Georgie. Now before we finish up, I would of course like to give a big thank you to Wiki Studios for providing us with today's viewer selection. Congratulations on being the wheels chosen and introducing Paranoia Escape to a wider audience. I'm sure you've scarred quite a few permanently in the process. And if you at home would like the chance to scar future viewers of the show and have a game that you'd like to recommend for the viewer wheel, drop it in the comments below and I'll get it added for future volumes of the series. Also, I'd like to give a special thank you to all my lovely supporters over on Patreon.com who help support my crippling Pepsi Max addiction, which means that I'm at an extreme enough level to keep making these videos. I'd also like to give a shout out to Alan Castlin, Crimson Cyclist, Dave Nolan, Doma, Globe99, Carl Winter, Moomatron, Moomin Biscuit, Trans Rights Are Human Rights, Mr. The Joshmon, and Richard Kramer, who have all subscribed at the Fan Plus Plus tier. And finally, a big thank you to everybody for simply just watching the video. I hope you enjoyed yet another look at the weird and wacky world of the Japanese PS1 library. I'll of course be back real soon with some more 5th gen goodness, but until then, look after yourselves, take it easy, and don't forget to praise the wheel. See ya!